If you have a Bible, go ahead and uh, open it and start looking for 1 Kings um, and also uh, for Mark, the Gospel of Mark. So we'll be in those two places in just a few minutes. Um, and if you uh, don't have a Bible, we'll put the verses on the screen. And if you don't own a print Bible and would like one, make sure you let us know that as you leave today. We'll be happy to give you one. Uh, we've been in the middle of a conversation for the last few weeks about how do you know and do the will of God. That's a pretty big conversation to have, so we've taken several weeks to have it. Uh, we've been looking at seven realities that we see in the Scripture um, that really help us to understand how do we know and do God's will. These realities are found really everywhere in the Old and the New Testament. You can see them, really, if you look at your own life, some of you have been walking with Jesus for a while, you may see these realities in your own life, in your own existence, at least I hope you have as we've gone through this. Uh, but if you're a first-time guest with us, um, you, you, it's not too late for you to jump in and, and get, get on board with this whole idea. Uh, we actually have a, a devotion guide. You can use this for your quiet time every day. It's got five daily assignments per week as it walks through these seven realities of knowing and doing the will of God. So if you want one of those just to help boost your personal quiet time, uh, pick one up as you leave. You can stop by the door there and ask Vicki. We'll be happy to get you one. Also, the messages for this series, as with all of our series, are on our website, aspirejacks.org. Uh, you can check us out there or the podcast and kind of catch up. But the whole idea really is just pretty simple, and that is that God wants you to know him. He wants you to know his purposes in the world, and he wants you to know his ways. Uh, he's not trying to keep it secret from you. In fact, he is uh, using every resource at his disposal, which there is no resource that is not at his disposal, to try to convince you and, and draw you to himself. He, he wants a relationship with you. So we've got a diagram that kind of maps this out. We'll put up here. And uh, the first thing we said in this series is that God is always at work around you. Uh, that God is working at all times, it, even when you don't see it, even when you don't feel it, just like the song said, God is working around you. The second thing that we said is to understand that God is always pursuing a continuing love relationship with you that's real and personal. God wants a personal relationship with you. He is pursuing, even before you drew your first breath, the psalmist says that God was forming you in your mother's womb. He has been pursuing you, a love, a love relationship with you that's real and personal. And then God invites us to become involved with him in his work, which is pretty amazing. If you look at all that God did through the Bible, you can see all these miracles, all these amazing things, and God chose every time to invite humans to join him in that effort. It's not that he needs us, God can do whatever he wants, but God invites us to become involved with him through his work. And then we said a couple weeks ago that God speaks, that God, just as God spoke in the Old Testament, as you hear him spoke through the prophets and through miraculous signs, as, as you see through the Gospels and the New Testament, God speaking through Jesus, so today God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances in the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and, and his ways. And then last week, we, we looked at this reality, that God's invitation always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. That, that as God is working and as God is inviting you to join him in that work, that invitation will always, not sometimes, not occasionally, not every once in a while, but that invitation will always lead you to a crisis of belief. And the word crisis means crisis. I mean, it means that it is going to be something that is going to be a conflict. It's going to be something that's going to be heart-wrenching, life-changing, life-altering. It's going to be something that causes you to upend the way you think, the way you act, your relationships. This crisis of belief, and it requires faith and action. Now, I want to, I want to just springboard off that as we get into this week's reality, and we look at the, these passages of Scripture here in just a second. But this crisis of belief that requires faith and action. James, who was the brother of Jesus, in one of the very first books that were written from the New Testament, James chapter 2, verse 26, that says this, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from deeds is dead. Me meaning, James is making a very simple observation here. Just like your body, if your spirit wasn't in it, would be dead, so your faith, if it doesn't have action, is dead. That, that it's one thing to say you believe something, it's another thing to let that faith and belief drive you to changing the way you live. See, I think for many of us, it's easy to sort of acknowledge mentally, hey, I believe this. Like, I believe these things. I, I've heard about these things. It's another thing for us to take that faith and allow it to then to change the way we actually think, the way we interact with our spouse, with our friends, with our coworkers, uh, the, the things we do. It's a different thing when we put it into action. Uh, Henry Blackaby says, adjustments prepare you for obedience. 
You cannot continue life as usual or stay where you are and go with God at the same time. There's no way that if God is inviting you to join him that you can just continue to live your comfortable best life now and go with God at the same time. The entire Bible is the story of nothing but men and women who are constantly being invited by God to join them and they're faced with this choice as they face this crisis of belief that that they're going to act in faith and take action to make these adjustments. I mean, think about the story of something as simple as Noah, right? Noah, build an ark. What's an ark, Lord? Well, let me show you what an ark is. What's Noah gonna do? It's one thing for him to believe God's speaking to him. It's another thing for him to actually start building the ark. You know, God calls Abraham and says, Abraham, I want you to pack up your, your wife and I want you to go to a land that I will show you. Well, where's that, Lord? Just start walking and I will show you as you're going on your way. And in order for Abram to go with God, he had to leave where he was. He had to take a step of obedience. It required faith and it required action. And here's what action is. If we're gonna follow God, action has to be adjustments we make in our life plus obedience to God. That that the adjustments we make aren't just adjustments we wanna make or adjustments that we heard suggested on Dr. Phil or Oprah Winfrey. I mean, this is like God is calling you to make an adjustment that may not make sense according to the world around you. In fact, I I I will wager that it won't make sense according to the world around you. That he's gonna ask you to make adjustments in your life and that faith in believing that God's calling you drives you to make these adjustments and you go with God where he's, where he's calling you to go. This is true throughout the Bible. And it's true in your life, it's true in mine. And so, so we get to this reality this week that we talk about. We're gonna look at these two passages. And the reality is this. You make major adjustments in your life to join God in what he's doing. That if you are going to join God, if you are going to be obedient to what God is calling you to do, you, not that you might have to, but you will have to make major adjustments in your life to, to join God in what he's doing. Now, to set this up, I wanna look at two stories of two people who have a lot in common. Uh, they are separated by hundreds of years in the Bible, but actually, uh, they're very, very similar in, in, in their life circumstances and in their encounter with God. One of these two young men makes an adjustment in his life to join God in what he's doing, and the other young man doesn't make an adjustment in his life to join God in what he's doing. So I wanna look at these two together. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open with me first to Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 17. Um, This may be a familiar story if you've been around Aspire for a while. We actually looked at this passage of scripture, the same story as told by the Gospel of Luke uh, several weeks ago. But I wanna look at it again because this is one of two characters who are faced with this crisis of belief. They have an encounter with God and they they have this crisis of belief that's gonna require faith and action. And then they're standing at the crossroads of knowing, do I make this major adjustment to go with God or not. So Mark chapter 10, beginning of verse 17, as Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt down before him. Now, already we know something about this kid. This, this guy is running up to Jesus. Clearly, he recognizes that God has been at work around him. Clearly, he has seen in Jesus' miracles as the dead have been raised, as the, the, the blind have been, have their, had their sight restored, as he's heard the teachings of Jesus. Something inside this young man was stirred. So he is running up to Jesus as Jesus is on his way. And not only does he run up to Jesus, he falls down on his knees before him. So this guy, is he's in. I mean, think about that. What would it take for you to run up and fall down on your knees? When's the last time you ran up and fell on your knees before somebody? I mean, maybe some of you guys did that when you asked somebody to marry you. Maybe that was the last time you did, you felt like it was even close. But I mean, it takes something pretty serious for you to run up to somebody and fall on your knees. Some desperation, some drive. This guy is being motivated by something beyond himself to come to Jesus. So he falls on his knees before Jesus and he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, other gospels translate this a different way. They say, good teacher, what must I do to be saved? So, so this guy is seeking He is looking for something here. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Now, Jesus is getting ready to set this up, okay? He knows this guy is a good Jew. He's a good religious kid. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Don't defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, great. Like, right? I've done all these things. Teachers, all these things I've kept since my youth. In other words, he can check all the religious boxes. He recognizes and knows all the things he's supposed to do. And so Jesus, listen to this now. 
Jesus, looking at him, loved him. I find this fascinating. First of all, how did Mark know that Jesus loved him? How did Mark know that? I think, and this is speculation on my part, but, but my guess is that there was a conversation that Jesus had with his disciples. And in that conversation, Jesus expressed such love for this kid that down through the years as the story is told, Mark writes it into his gospel account because he wants you, the reader, to know that Jesus loved this kid. He loved him. And what we see in this is that God has always been pursuing this kid, this rich young ruler. He's been pursuing a continuing love relationship with him that is real and personal. That, that this guy might think, well, I've been following God. I'm chasing after Jesus. I'm falling on my knees. But the reality is it was always Jesus who was chasing this guy. He always wanted this love relationship with him. So Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. So here, here it is, right? God's invitation. Jesus is inviting him. Go sell everything and come follow me. He's inviting him to join him in his work. And now this kid faces a crisis of belief. What's he gonna do? What's he gonna do? He's got two choices. He either continues to live the way he's lived, doing all the things he's always done, or he does exactly what Jesus has called him to do, go sell everything and come follow Jesus. He is facing a crisis of belief that's gonna require faith and action. And the question is, will he make the major adjustment to join God in his work? Jesus' call for this guy to follow him led him to a crisis of belief. And this man, is, if he's gonna do it, if he's gonna take this step of faith, it's gonna cost him something. And look what it says in verse 22. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He decided, Jesus, I know you love me. I love you. I I'm a good religious kid. I'm gonna keep showing up at church. I'm gonna keep doing everything that I'm supposed to do. I'm gonna keep checking all the boxes. But sell everything? Follow you? I'd make an adjustment in my life like that? God, I just, I don't think I can do it. And he goes away sad. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them, children, how difficult is it to enter the kingdom of God? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. What is Jesus talking about here? Jesus is talking about money. Sure, he's talking about money. But think of it, it's something bigger than that. He's saying how difficult it is for people to leave the way they were living and follow him. To abandon everything that is comfortable, everything that is secure, everything that is familiar, to leave all of that behind and go with Jesus, it would be easier to take a camel and stuff it through the eye of a needle than to do that. Because listen to what the disciples say in response. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? I, mean, I don't know about you, but anytime I hear this passage or read this passage or, or, or think about this passage, I'm confronted with that same thought. Jesus, are, are you calling me to sell everything I have? Are you asking me to abandon everything I have and follow, Jesus, follow you? Is, is that what the invitation is for me? Is that the level of adjustment you're asking me to make in my life? Now, now my guess is he's not. But here's the thing. Would you be willing? Are, are, is your answer to God yes before you even know what, what, the, what the question is? Before you know what the sacrifice would be? Before you know what the adjustment would be? That, that Jesus is asking him, would you sell everything and follow me? And the disciples are like, Jesus, this bar is high. This is not living my best life now. This is costly. This is, this is gonna change the way I live. This is, this is about comfort. This is about security. Jesus looked at them and said, with man it's impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. You see, here, here's the good news. The major adjustment that you have to make requires faith, and you don't come up with faith on your own. Faith is a gift that God gives you. <laughs> that God is the one who provides the faith that you need to make these adjustments. It's not you just gutting it out and, and seeing how much can I be a martyr for the cause of Christ. I mean, if that's what he calls you to do, then that's what he calls you to do. But here's the thing. So often we're unwilling to make the small sacrifices. And Jesus is saying, I will give you the faith you will need. But you are gonna to have to take that faith and turn it into action as you make adjustments in your life and you follow after me. 
And listen to what Peter said. I love that this is included. And Peter began to say to him, see, we have left everything and followed you. I mean, I think this is one of those moments where Peter, who was along with the rest of the disciples, was discouraged just a few seconds ago. Like, then who can follow you? And Jesus, is, Jesus says to them, hey, with God it's possible. And Peter, the light goes off. He's like, man, I've already done it. I'm already doing that. And for some of you here today, you are already doing that. You've already made major adjustments in your life. You've already left behind bad habits and addictions and you, you've already fixed broken relationships and you have done the hard work and are doing the hard work of moving forward. And like Peter, you need to take that moment and look back and say, I have made major adjustments in my life to go with God. And by making major adjustments, you have come to know God in a way you didn't know him before. It, it's, not, it's not just book knowledge. It's not just head knowledge, but it's migrated from your head to your heart as you have actually made the adjustments in your life it's like the difference between reading a biography of some, about somebody and knowing somebody. So, so many of us as Christians, we are biography readers. We're avid biography readers of Jesus, and we love the stories of Jesus, and we love the teachings of Jesus. We just don't have an experience with Jesus because we're not willing to make the major adjustment in our life that it would require for us to go with him. And, and we, we love him, but we love him at a distance. We love him the way I love people I read about in biographies. The love that doesn't cost me anything. But Jesus' invitation is for us to, to join him in his work. And in order to, to do that, we're going to have to make the adjustments that he calls us to make. So I said we're going to look at two, two people. Uh, Mark chapter 10. Let's look at another character whose reaction is different. Open, with, open your Bible with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. A little bit more of maybe an obscure story for some of you. Let me set it up for you, first of all, um, by introducing you to two people, two Bible characters. Um, the first one's name is Elijah with a J, and the second one is Elisha with an S-H. As if Bible names aren't hard enough, they also rhyme sometimes and makes it hard. So Elijah is a famous prophet, a famous prophet. Um, in fact, he's sort of the iconic prophet of the Old Testament. Um, he, he has done some amazing things. He has driven out all the, all the priests of Baal. He, he, God used him so many times to go to the evil kings of Israel and to call them to task. I mean, he was just a, he was a, a firebrand. I mean, he, he was just an iconic, iconic preacher. But he's getting older, and God's about to say, okay, it's time for you to hang it up, and we're going to call in a new young guy, and um, we're going to go with Elisha. Okay, so this is the invitation God is giving to Elisha through Elijah to take his place, to be a prophet in his place. So uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 15. And the Lord said to Elijah, to him, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nishmi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of, son of Shaphat, of Abel Mehalo, you shall anoint to be the prophet in your place. So... He departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shephat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him. Now, let me translate that for you. Elisha was rich. I mean, Elisha was rich. You were lucky in this day and age. You would have been lucky to have one ox to plow your field. And Elisha had 12 oxen to plow his field. So this joker is wealthy. He's got more money than any of us can imagine, all right? So he, he's plowing with 12 oxen, and he was with the 12th, meaning that he's at the very back. His life's pretty easy. Like, if you're gonna have to farm, you want to be the 12 oxen guy. That's the guy you wanna be because the oxen are doing all the work. So he's back there, the field's being plowed. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak on him. Now, that doesn't mean anything to us, but in this day and age, if a prophet or a rabbi were to go by and cast their cloak on you, basically what that means is, hey, dude, you are now gonna be my disciple, my apprentice, you're gonna take my place, okay? You're, you're taking the mantle on you. You're going to be the new prophet in town. Uh, goes on from there to verse, nine, uh, verse uh, 20. And so he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me kiss my father and mother and then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again for what have I done to you? I love this. Because if anybody knew the price that Elisha was about to have to pay to be obedient, to follow God, it was Elijah. Because he'd spent his whole life paying the price. 
He had paid the price over and over again. And he's looking at this young guy, this this young guy with his whole future before him. He's got wealth, he's got position, and he's looking at him. And this kid is saying, hold on, let me just go say goodbye to my mom and dad, and I'm going with you. And Elijah's looking at him, he's like, what have I just done to you? Like the price you are about to have to pay is so high. What have I done to you? And and notice something about Elisha here that's so amazing. He knew that it was God speaking. Somehow, Elisha understood that God was speaking through Elijah. He knew exactly what God wanted him to do, and he responded immediately. He didn't say, let me go back to my mom and dad and talk this over. He said, I'm going to go kiss them goodbye. How did he know? See, here's, here's one of the things that I think is so important for us, especially if you're like wrestling. You know what God wants you to do. You just don't know if now is when he wants you to do it. He, here's, what, here's what the testimony from Scripture is over and over again. When God speaks, that is God's timing. When God speaks, that is God's timing. That when God told Noah to build a boat, a flood was coming, Noah didn't have time to wait around. Like, that was God's timing. Get ready because I'm about to do something. When God called Moses to leave the desert and go back to Pharaoh to say, let my people go, that was God's timing. Elisha knew this was God's timing. And sometimes in our walk with Christ, we're like, okay, I think this is what God wants me to do, but, but how do I know for sure if it's God's timing? Well, chances are good that if God's called you to do something, he's called you to do it right then. He's called you to be obedient in that moment. Now, that doesn't mean you don't pray about it. We talked about that last week with Esther. Esther fasted and prayed. It doesn't mean you don't seek wise counsel. It doesn't mean all those things. But it does mean that so many times for us, it's like, okay, I think this is what God's calling me to do. God, I'm just gonna wait for you to give me a sign. Right? Like, God, would you just give me a sign? And like, what else do you want God to do? Like, he's, he's given you his word. He, he's surrounded you with other believers. He, he's put circumstances in your life. He's speaking to you through prayer. I mean, like, God has given you all the sign you're going to get. What are you waiting for? And Elijah, Elisha didn't wait around. He knew it was God's timing. He understood, he understood that it was time to move. And look what he did next. This is so amazing to me. And he returned from following him. Listen to this. He took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes. In other words, all of the yokes that were on the oxen, all sets of those, he took those yokes and he set a bonfire and he slaughtered all 12 of the oxen and they had a big barbecue for everybody in the town. Talk about burning the bridges behind you. That's exactly what Elisha was doing. He's like, I am in. And not only am I in, Watch this. We're going to have a huge feast. I'm going to feed everybody in town. I'm going to burn the, the yoke because I, I'm not going to need him anymore because I am following after God. So he burned the, yoke, burned the yokes of oxen and the oxen and he gave it to all the people and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. This is such an amazing testimony of faith. But, but you know, when you read this, I, I can't help but think about his parents. I mean, Think about the fact that this was costly to Elisha, but it was also costly to his mom and dad. I mean, I don't know who was gonna plow the field, but somebody else was gonna have to plow the field, and now they didn't have 12 oxen to do it with, right? And here's why I think this is important, because your obedience to follow God will be costly to you and to the people around you. Your obedience to follow God isn't just costly to you. If it were just costly to you, it'd be a lot easier, wouldn't it? And here's where I think some of us, some of us as Christians, where, where we get this wrong. We think, okay, God, I really think you're calling me to be obedient, to follow you in this. And God, I recognize the major adjustment that it's going to take for me to do it. But God, that also means something for my wife. It means something for my kids. It means something for my parents. It means something for my friends. It means something for my community. God, I'd be willing to pay the price, but it's not fair for me to ask them to pay the price. You, you know that's flawed thinking. Because if God is calling you to pay the price, don't you think he recognizes and understands the price that the people around you are going to have to pay? And, and more than that, listen, how do you know that that's not God working in their life in order to draw them closer to him? And how are you not so sure that by you, being, by you refusing to ask them to pay the price, 
that you are not preventing them from seeing God work in their life in a way that he's been working in your life. Let me tell you something. You are not God. I know that's news to some folks. You're not God. You don't get to make those decisions. I mean, this is the idea that God calls you and the weight of that call falls where it will fall and it will be costly to you, but it will be costly to the people around you too. And you have to have faith enough and believe in God enough to trust him with the outcome, not just for you, but for them. Every time God calls you to make an adjustment, it will be costly to you. And most likely it will also be costly to the people that God has put around you as well. So let's just take just a few minutes as we wrap it up this morning and just compare Elisha from 1 Kings 19 to the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10. I just want to make a couple brief comparisons and then we'll wrap it up. First, God was at work in both young men. You see it in the rich young ruler. He's clearly aware of who Jesus is. He's clearly aware of the miracles. He, fall, he runs after Jesus and he falls on his knees. God was at work around this young man. But so was God at work around Elisha. Elijah had just defeated the prophets of Baal. I mean, he was like the most wanted man in Israel at the time. And, and he recognized that God was doing something. God was at work around both men. God was pursuing a continuing love relationship with both men that was real and personal. God told Elijah, hey, I want you to go and find Elisha and anoint him to be the next prophet. Think about that. Like God already recognized something in Elisha and God told Elijah to be the one to go call him. But it was God who was pursuing Elisha all along. And God was pursuing the rich young ruler as well. That, that he ran up to Jesus and knelt before him, it says in verse 17. And Jesus looked at the rich young ruler, Mark tells us, and he loved him. And, and I think this is so amazing. Because I don't think Jesus' love for him expired when the rich young ruler went away sad and didn't sell everything. Jesus still loved him. Some of you have heard God call you, and like the rich young ruler, you've walked away, and maybe you've been convinced or you've believed a lie that because you walked away, God's love for you expired. It's not true. God's love for you does not change. We can all look back at times and realize there have been times where we've been disobedient. God's love for you did not change. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's love for you is not dependent on your obedience, but here's what, here's what is true. Your obedience to God is a reflection of your love for him, not of his love for you. See, the rich young ruler walking away sad wasn't a reflection of Jesus' love for the rich young ruler. It was a reflection of his love for Jesus. He didn't love him enough. He didn't trust him enough to believe that selling everything he had and following him was actually what was best. The third comparison is that God was inviting both men to join him in his work. Elijah threw the cloak on Elijah Elisha, and it was his invitation to join him. The rich young ruler, Jesus invited him to go sell his possessions and give to the poor and then follow him. God was speaking to both men. The Holy Spirit spoke to Elijah and said, go anoint Elijah. But also you see in the rich young ruler, he was a student of the scripture. He knew the 10 commandments. He knew the law. God had already been speaking to him. Both men faced a crisis of belief that required faith and action. Both men were wealthy, and obedience would cost them both their entire wealth. Elijah, Elisha, would, would he be willing to leave behind his wealth and his family and his way of life to follow God? The rich young ruler, would he be a part? Would he part with his wealth and, and follow after Jesus? Both men faced a crisis of belief. And finally, only Elisha was willing to make a major adjustment in his life to join God in what he was doing. It's so amazing to me, if you, if you know the story of Elijah and Elisha, Elisha's ministry went on and lasted twice as long as his mentor Elijah's. In fact, if you read the scripture, uh, Elisha performed twice as many miracles as Elijah did. We've got 14 miracles recorded by Elisha and only seven recorded by Elijah. But when you look at the rich young ruler, do you know all we know about him? Is that he went away sad and we never hear from him again. He went away sad. He went away loved by God, but he went away sad. And, and here's what I think is true about the rich young ruler. And I don't know, it's speculation on my part, but here's my guess. Because he's a good Jewish boy living in the first century, he kept showing up at synagogue. He kept reading Torah. He kept going through all the religious motions. He kept singing the songs, but he stayed sad. He stayed sad his whole life. 
because he wasn't having an experience with God. God had invited him to join him in his work. And it doesn't mean that at some point later God wouldn't invite him again. But at least in that season of life, for however long it lasted, he had been invited to join God in what he was doing. And he went away sad and he stayed sad and he stayed religious. He stayed faithful. But he didn't live the kind of life that God called him to live. And he didn't have an experience with God that he could have had because he simply didn't trust God enough to walk away. And here's where it comes to us, especially if you're here today and like you're religious and you come to church regularly. And maybe for some of you, you realize that, man, I'm that rich. I, there was a time in my life where I sensed God was calling me and I didn't do it. And now I feel like I'm that rich young ruler. Like I'm showing up at church. I still believe in God. I still believe in Jesus. I still sing the songs. But there's, there's a lack of joy in my life. The good news for you is that it's never too late as long as God's given you breath. It's never too late to be obedient to what God's called you to do. And here's what I'm gonna challenge us to do, everybody, whether you're a believer in the room or not, is to identify an adjustment you need to make to join God in what he's doing. Identify an adjustment that you need to make in your life to join God in what he's doing. For some of you, that is simply surrendering to Jesus. That is recognizing that Jesus is inviting you to be his follower, to trust him and follow him. To, to, to leave behind a life of sin and say, I'm gonna commit my life to following after Jesus. For some of you, it's that. For some of you, it's saying, you know what? I need to be involved with the body of Christ. I need, to get, I need to find a community. I need to find a church where I need to be a part. And I don't just mean showing up. I mean, I need to be a part of what God is doing, whether that's at Aspire or some other church. For some of you, for some of you, God has put a very specific call on your heart and your life. And you are wrestling because you know the price you're gonna have to pay. And even if you're okay with the price you have to pay, maybe you're not okay with the price that your family's gonna have to pay. But can I ask you this? Be real. Because this really gets to the core of what you believe. Do you believe that God loves your family more than, he, more than you love them? Because if he does, if he does and he's calling you, then you have to trust him with them and with you and your future. What adjustment do you need to make to join God in what he's doing. We're gonna sing a song and we're gonna have just a time of commitment. For some of you, maybe you are wrestling right now with that decision to follow after Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe for some of you, it's as simple as just saying, I, I, I wanna be baptized, I wanna join a church. For some of you, maybe it's a call that God's placed on your life. Maybe it's a way of thinking, a prejudice. Maybe it's a relationship that you need to say, I need to go back and talk to this person. I need to restore this relationship. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's, it has to do with your job with your future, with your career. Maybe it's something about your school or your education. I just don't know. But I do believe this. God is working around us. I believe that. I believe God is working in the hearts and lives of so many of you who are here. In fact, I would say every one of you who are here right now. And it may be different for every one of you, but what is the same is that God is working. What is the same is that God is pursuing you with, for a love relationship that's real and personal. What is the same is that God is inviting you to join him. What is the same is that God is speaking and that God's invitation has got you on the precipice of a crisis of belief. But what will be different will be, will you go the way of the rich young ruler and walk away? Or like Elijah, will you burn the bridges and follow Jesus?